All right, we should get started. Welcome to the last day of class. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about browser architecture and uh, writing secure code. We have two topics. But I want to start with uh, the last uh, little bit from the last lecture on DNS rebinding. So if you recall, we have uh, a DNS rebinding attack that works like this. The browser um, gets navigated to an attacker's website. The browser does a DNS lookup for attacker.com. And the attacker set their um, response to be the actual server that they control. So the browser goes ahead and makes an HTTP request to that server, and which sends back a page. The page loads. And then at this point, the attacker actually goes and um, changes their DNS entry such that it returns a localhost IP address. And then the code that's running in the attacker page makes a request to the same exact or similar URL uh, as it did the first time. So it's the same origin URL. And uh, the DNS lookup happens again. And this time, we get the localhost um, IP returned. And uh, because of that, uh, we are, when, we, when we actually send the HTTP request, the server that it goes to is the server at this IP instead of the server at 999. And this happens to be a, a server that's running locally on our machine. And so uh, the browser is going to go ahead and uh, realize that this is the same origin request, and it's going to allow it to go through. And so that's how the attack is pulled off. And so um, we talked a little bit about how to defend against this. And uh, I, we showed some code here, but the crux of it came down to uh, adding, adding a little bit of it's a very, very few lines of code where you basically check that the host header is uh, a local host uh, value. And if you see that, then you know that somebody hasn't done a DNS rebinding attack. Because if they had, that would be set to the origin that the browser thinks it's talking to, which is attacker.com. right? So we can look at that and tell. Yeah, we talked about this. OK, so let's talk a little bit about just the attack surface of local servers in general, just to sort of tie it all together. So in general, when you're starting a local server on, on a machine, you bind it to the local IP address. Uh, that's what we see there. That's what I've, I've mentioned a couple times before. By adding that second argument when you call listen, you're basically saying don't allow people who connect to this server uh, to don't allow any connections to the server from other machines on the same network as me. Just allow applications running on the same computer to connect. And it gives you a little bit of uh, uh, reduced attack surface. But even if you forget to do that, in general, when you bind to all interfaces, um, you actually still oftentimes can't get incoming connections to the local server because your operating system has a built-in software firewall that will actually look at all incoming connections and decide whether to allow it to go through or not. And so uh, typically, it, it will be blocked. Um, as well, just by the operating system. Um, and, uh, and then also, we have to think about the DNRC binding. In general, you're, you're vulnerable to this unless you take proactive measures by checking the host header. So don't rely on the operating system to, pr to protect you, because uh, like, even, even if it, it, even if it um, you know, does this, you're still vulnerable to, uh, to attacks from your own browser. That's the whole idea of this DNRC binding. Remember, the idea is your browser becomes a proxy for the attacker. So their code is running, you know, their JavaScript is running in your browser, and it's able to make requests to these uh, services, your, either your IoT devices or local servers that are running on your machine, right? And so you can't rely on those um, defenses. Now, this is the software firewall I was talking about. This is what it looks like in macOS. Um, you, it's, it's, hopefully, it's on on your computer. If it's not, you should turn it on. Uh, it's a good idea. Uh, if you click the little Options button, you get this little page that pops up that shows you all the applications on your computer which you have allowed incoming connections to. And one thing that's interesting is this box is checked by default, which allows any software that has a signature. So the software is signed by the developer, and that developer signed it with a key that Apple has, uh, has seen and has also signed. And so that's, that's part of the certificate. And so the idea here is that uh, you're, the default is that you're basically saying if this developer has sort of identified themselves uh, and Apple has not yet revoked their certificate, then I'm willing to just let them listen for connections from um, any machines. Um, so what this means is that if some other device on the network or on the internet tries to connect to this locally running server on your computer, if it's signed by the developer, it will be allowed. This is just like the policy that, uh, that, that Mac has gone with. Um, I s the question? So just, uh, just one on the last slide. Is there anything that they're wanting to bring up? 
Is there anything special that they would like about this in terms of like being anti lightning attacks? Like is there anything that could throw through some that they like that would probably not be answered through a DMX query in time? I don't think there's anything like that. Okay. Yeah. You might be able to customize something on Linux or something like that, but not that I know of. Um, but yeah, so, and, and this is what it looks like on Windows. So if you've ever, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this prompt if you've ever used a Windows computer before. To be honest, it's extremely confusing and I didn't understand what this was asking for a really long time. I generally just hit allow and then, you know, it my game or whatever I'm trying to play works. But these checkboxes actually, like, there's a distinction between private networks and public networks. And what's going on here is Windows is trying to protect you from local servers that the software that you're running has started up. So say you've, in this case, what is this, some kind of uh, input whatever, input personalization server, I don't know what that is, but uh, this could be a game or whatever you've started on your computer, and it's, uh, it's started up a server, and it, that server's waiting for connections. Uh, and until you click allow access here, no connections are gonna be allowed from other devices on the network. So that means other computers in the public internet or other devices on your home network. Now if you click allow with this private box checked, what you're saying is, if I'm on a home network, so every time you connect to a Wi-Fi network, you can say, is this my home? Am I in home? Is this a network I trust? Or am I on like a public Wi-Fi hotspot? So every Wi-Fi network is categorized as one or the other. And so then when you see a box like this and you say allow on private networks, what it'll do is if you're actually on one of those networks that you said you trusted, then any other device on that network can make connections to your computer and to, that, to, to this particular app that's listening for connections, right? And so the default is that you wouldn't check that on public networks because you don't necessarily want this application, which may, may not have the best coding practices and, and uh, you know, may not be secure, to just start getting connections from other devices on the network. So this could be like you know, other Stanford users or other Starbucks Wi-Fi users that, that, are, that are trying to connect to you. And so that's their, their sort of approach to, to defending your, your, your local servers from attack. Um, now, of course, remember, all this has nothing to, this, none, none of these actually defend you against a DNS rebinding attack. This is defending you against sort of other malicious devices on the network connecting to a local server. Um, but you're still vulnerable to, to DNS rebinding because again, your browser has become this proxy and it's on the same device. So it actually doesn't go through this, this firewall stuff at all, right? So keep that in mind. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's local servers. That's sort of the attack service of local servers. Now let's quickly talk about IoT devices. So IoT devices, generally, they're bound, bound to alt interfaces because they're running a server intentionally expecting connections from other devices on the same network. That's like a Chromecast or an, a Google Home or whatever. These are expecting connections from other devices. And usually they have no firewall configured because they want these in incoming connections to go through. And, uh, and these are vulnerable to, um, you know, to, uh, if you have a malicious device, um, it can make connections to it. And you know, these IoT devices will be vulnerable. Um, and you know, in general, any web page can make connections to these IoT devices if they're listening for HTTP um, requests. Uh, what DNS rebinding gives us is it allows us to upgrade those requests from simple requests that, that all web pages are allowed to make to any origin, like, you know, get requests for an image or something. We can upgrade that using DNS rebinding so that the browser thinks it's the same origin request and therefore lets us make the request more complicated, lets us make it, you know, put, delete all these other methods and add headers and make the, you know, potentially open up new avenues for attack. So that's what DNS rebinding lets us do, lets us upgrade the, the, the attacks we can do. Um, yeah, and then of course these are hard to update uh, you know, after they're shipped to the customer because the, there's a lot of price pressure and consumers don't really uh, check for the security of their devices when they're buying. They're usually looking for the cheapest price. And they, they say that the, the S in IoT stands for security. So, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, there's one uh, kind of cool story, uh, well, interesting story uh, of this massive botnet. Who's heard of Mirai, this botnet before? Okay, yeah. So. Uh, this is uh, this was like a huge story a few years ago. Some teens were they basically managed to take over so many IoT devices, uh, like a huge number all across the world. Um, and the way that the, the reason why they did this is because they were they were in some kind of a feud with uh, some other uh, teenagers who were running a competing Minecraft server. And so <laughs> they were like trying to take down the hosting of of, of this this mi this Minecraft uh, this Minecraft server. They were trying to take down the host. Eventually, they 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 started wanting to attack. Um, the DNS provider of, of, the, Minec of the Minecraft host. Um, and, and I think in general, I don't know if they were actually looking for profit in this case, but um, this is also a thing that like these Minecraft hosts do because they want to sort of make the, the servers of the, of, of the other host go down so that the players will just switch over to paying a different company. So it's like competitors attacking each other. But in this case, these were literally like 
teenagers who did this. Um, and they managed to amass like a, a huge botnet army that they used then to direct a bunch of traffic to these Minecraft hosts to try to take them down. And they did this using people's IoT devices. So things like you know, your toaster or your thermostat could, be, could have been part of these teenagers' attacks against you know, this Minecraft server that they're trying to take down. Um, yeah, it was <laughs> very, very um, amusing. And um, yeah, and so this was partly enabled by, you know, the, you know, in this case, I don't think they necessarily used DNS rebinding because a lot of these devices happen to just be listening directly to connections from any device on the internet. Like there was no firewall at all here. There was no need to use DNS rebinding. The attackers were literally able to just connect directly to the devices and they were, they were vulnerable to, you know, take over. Um, and um, the other thing too is even if they weren't vulnerable to take over, a lot of these devices come with default passwords like admin is, you know, admin or something and, and, and attackers know that these passwords and they can try them and, and, and get into the devices that way. Um, but yeah, so, so uh, other thing that, that the teenagers did that was kind of funny is they included Russian language strings in, inside of their, um, their, their malware because they wanted to sort of make uh, anyone looking into this think that it was like a, you know, they're sort of trying to divert attention over to other people, which is pretty, pretty amusing. And they also tried a little bit to avoid like attention from law enforcement and from large companies. So they had like IP blocks included in their malware that which basically they wouldn't attack any IoT devices on like the de Department of Defense network or Hewlett Packard and GE. Um, so they, yeah, they were still kind of amateurish, but it's, it's kind of funny that they tried to do this. Anyway, so, so yeah, so that's, so that's IoT devices. Um, now, you know, even if the devices are secure, you still have to think about this DNS rebinding thing, and you have to check that host header. And so, you know, these devices need to do that on top of, you know, all of this basic stuff, like not having default passwords and not having the device listening to the whole network. Um, yeah, and I wanted to just mention a couple of, of actual, like, real-world cases where DNS rebinding became, you know, was an issue. So one is all Blizzard games come with this piece of software called the Blizzard Update Agent. And this is installed alongside the Blizzard game that you happen to be installing. And what it does, it starts up an HTTP server, a local HTTP server. Um, so that's already like red flag right there. And then it, it happens to accept commands from you know, anyone who can connect to that server. And those commands will, will tell this software to go and download uh, binaries from the internet and install them or run them, execute them. And so the idea here is like, you know, it's, it's a way for a game, you know, a game can sort of maybe hit this updates, you know, hit the update server with a request and cause it to update the game or update some component that the game happens to be using. But the server was vulnerable to DNS rebinding. They didn't check the host header. And what this meant was that any website on the internet could send a request to this server and then point and tell it, here's the file I want you to download and execute. And your computer will happily go ahead and download that file and execute that. So if you're browsing the web with this software installed in your computer, you're basically letting any website execute whatever code it wants on your computer, assuming it knows you know, that it can do this. And so yeah, it was really bad. And yeah, it allowed you know, RCE, which is like the worst possible type of attack to, to have. Uh, and uh, this was reported by, by uh, this thing called Google, Google Project Zero, which uh, finds a whole bunch of really interesting bugs in, in other companies' products. And so they reported it to, to Blizzard, and they got a fix out for it. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a real huge example of, of uh, DNS rebinding. Another one that happened is uh, Transmission. Who's heard of Transmission? It's a BitTorrent uh, client. It's popular on Mac. I think it, it's on all the platforms now, too. Anyway, um, so when you install Transmission, the way they, they, they developed their application is they um, split up the code such that the UI that you see in the application, it's a native application, so it's, you know, it's, running on your, it's installed on your computer, it's running on your computer. The UI for it is... Um, is kind of, it's just really simple. All it is is a bunch of buttons, and the real logic of the BitTorrent protocol is implemented in a separate uh, process. So you have two processes, one for the UI and one for actually talking to the torrent network and to connecting to peers and doing all this kind of stuff. And the, the, the UI would basically just send little messages to the, to the um, we call it, there's the, it's just a client-server model. So the client would be the UI and the server would be the, the, the process that actually talks to the network. And um, the issue was that server was listening for connections from the UI, but it turns out anyone could connect to the server, not just the UI of the transmission app. And so because they, they didn't defend against DNS rebinding, they didn't check the host header, that meant that, again, any site on the internet that you're browsing on could send a request to this transmission server that's listening on your computer and cause it to, uh, you know, you'd think it would maybe just allow you to download a torrent or something like that, but in fact, there were certain endpoints on this server which would just execute code. So anyone who could send a request could just basically run a, run a, you know, run a shell script on your computer. So really bad. Um, again, this was found by the same, uh, same person at Google Project Zero uh, and uh, reported the transition, and they, they fixed it. But when this, so when this happened, um, so I, I actually, I develop a BitTorrent app myself. 
called WebTorrent that, uh, I, that I think it's, it's a cool project. Uh, it's, it's a thing I've worked on for a few years. But when I saw that this uh, DNS rebinding attack happened to, to transmission, the first thing I thought was, am I doing something like this in my own code? Uh, let me check very carefully for this because this would be really embarrassing. Uh, you know, and, and especially, it's such a bad bug. It's RCE, right? I was really worried. So I started looking through the WebTorrent code. And yes, we had DNS rebinding. We had a DNS rebinding vulnerability as well. The good news was that uh, ours didn't allow the attacker to just send a command that our server would just run. So it wasn't RCE. It wasn't you know the worst type of attack. But uh, but there, we were running a local server that uh, an attacker could send a request to to uh, learn what content the user is torrenting. So they could basically they could uh, fetch little like actually pieces of the torrent and uh, and view it and sort of see like you know what, what is this user looking at. Um, yeah, so that's the idea. And I have. Um, the actual diff here that fixed the issue, which is uh, maybe interesting to see. So the way we fixed it was we added this uh, little check here that all it does is it says when, uh, so yeah, I should probably just quickly give a little bit of context about like what, um, uh, what the, why, why, we're, why are we running a local server? So uh, thanks, thanks for indulging me here while I show you this. Um, so there's a command that you can run on the command line um, that you give it a torrent link, and then it will go ahead and actually start to download that torrent for you. These are all peers that it's connecting to right now. Um, this is a legal torrent. It's a oh, Creative Commons a piece of Creative Commons content. But you'll notice here it created an HTTP server. And if I copy this URL and visit it in the browser, it'll actually start to play back this video for me, which is which is pretty cool. Um, and so that's why we create the HTTP server. It lets it enables this use case of basically this this content is now being sort of served by the torrent program to the browser and it supports this use case where I can actually seek to different parts of the video and it's going to dynamically like make a new request for that part of the video and the torrent app can detect that you know it sees this request because it's getting the request and it can be like oh I should go start to fetch that part of the file because that's the part that the user wants so anyway that, there's kind of a legit reason for the for the for the local server um, you know uh, but again local servers are hard to get right and so so yeah so so what, what ended up happening was um, we didn't check the host header, and so this is the fix. When you go to start up this, this server, you can tell it um, this is the host name. So you give it an option. You say this is the host name that I want you to check, um, and if any requests come in and, and the host header doesn't match this option, then just close the connection. That's the idea, and that's how you defend against DNS rebinding. So that's what we did here. We checked the host header. If it's not the same, uh, then we return false, and we, we thought that would actually fix the issue, and uh, it turns out this didn't fix the issue because this fix was, is just wrong. It doesn't actually work. We tested it and it looked like it worked. And so this was actually vulnerable for a whole nother like six months <laughs> after it was fixed. Uh, because if you expand the code here, I'll show you exactly what went wrong. Um, it's pretty wild. So, uh, so let's see here. There's right here. This is the code that runs whenever an HTTP request come in, c comes in. You can think of this like it's the handler for, for any requests that come in. And uh, one of the things we check is we say we, we, there's an origin header, you know, that's saying which site is making this request to us, and we check that and see is this origin allowed to make the request, and um, if it is, then we're going to set this access control allow origin header. And so when we went to go fix the DNS rebinding issue, we put the code inside of is origin allowed. So if I scroll back up, you'll see that function is uh, is right here is origin allowed. This is where we put this code. And so what does that mean? That means that when when the host doesn't match we return false. Instead of closing the connection, we just return false. And that causes, what does that cause to happen? It causes this header to not get set. That doesn't actually stop the issue, right? So there's a distinction. This is really important. There's a distinction between the origin header and the host header. Don't get them confused. So the origin header, that's attached to a request. And it tells the site, this is the origin. This is the page, basically, that, that is making this request. So uh, this would be, uh, you know, um, it would be whatever, yeah, whatever site, whatever page we're on that's making the request, and then host is that's that's the um, that's what site we're trying to connect to. So it has nothing to do really with the page that we're on. It's like I'm trying to talk to this server right now, and that's the host header, right? And the way you detect DNS rebinding is you look at the you look at the host and you see is the host not localhost? It's like attacker.com or something. Okay, so anyway, the fix here was uh, in a in a later pull request we moved the code. And some person, some lucky person, found this bug and got like hundreds of dollars of bug bounty for it because this is code. This code is in, included in the, in the Brave browser, and so they actually have a bug bounty program and paid out this person for finding this. Uh, but I was like, we fixed this issue. What is the issue? And 
Anyway, so you can see here, basically the fix was we just deleted the code from, the, from that function and moved it to um, the very first piece of code that runs when you get a request. And we just say, is, if the host doesn't match, then just close the connection, like destroy the socket and just don't talk to them because this is a DNS rebinding attack. Yeah, so anyway, the, the links are in there. You can take a closer look um, if you want later. Um, but yeah, so remember the difference between origin and host. Review that. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important to know the difference. And then, of course, just try not to ship a local server to your users if you can um, because it's, it's just uh, it's risky. Um, cool. So now we will move on to today's topic. Um, we have two topics, <coughs> browser architecture and some tips on writing secure code that I'm going to leave you with. So, oh yeah, but I guess some admin first. So yeah, uh, some, some important details. The final exam is going to be on Tuesday. That's the time. That's the place. I'm going to release a sample final tomorrow so you can see the format of the final um, and get an idea about it. Um, there's one person who asked for an alternate exam, so we're going to do an alternate exam on, on Monday. Um, if you also can't make the exam time for some reason, uh, then you can let me know and we can, we can add you to the, to the Monday uh, alternate exam. It's probably going to be in the afternoon or the evening. Um, and uh, if you have any accommodations, email me by today. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have office hours after class today if you have any questions about any of the content in the class uh, as, you, as you're uh, preparing for the final. Cool. Any questions about this? Cool. Okay. So let's talk about browser architecture. So one thing we should ask ourselves is, how does the browser defend us as we're browsing around the web? Um, from, you know, like, you know, from, from all kinds, of, there's all kinds of crazy sites that we visit. There's ads, there's all kinds of untrusted code that's constantly running in our browser. So we've already talked about the same origin policy a whole bunch. We know that the browser is trying really hard to, you know, isolate sites from interfering with each other and all this kind of stuff. But there's still like this other question of like, how does the browser actually take some untrusted code and run it securely? And uh, what happens when that goes wrong? What happens when the browser is trying to run some JavaScript, and uh, it turns out that JavaScript manages to trick the uh, interpreter that is interpreting the JavaScript and get it to do something it's not supposed to do. You know, get it to do something that JavaScript on the web is not supposed to be allowed to do, like say, read a file on your computer, or open a socket to some service it's not supposed to be able to do, or to execute you know, native code. These are all things that JavaScript can't do because there's a sandbox that it's running in. And so, um, yeah, we should ask ourselves that, and we should think about, like, um, how, like it's, it's actually interesting if you look at what browsers have done to ensure that even when they make bugs and they make mistakes in executing this untrusted JavaScript, that they can still protect your computer against, you know, total, you know, ownage, the, the sort of worst thing that can happen, which is that a site has managed to, to completely, you know, just start running code on your computer. So, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, does everybody understand what I'm saying? Basically, we're, we're talking about attack. This is attacking users through their browsers. So, how how is your computer protected while you browse around the wild west of the web and, and you visit all kinds of untrusted sites? So, um, so there's like a whole. This is a whole topic that um, you know uh, we're not going to get super deep into. But I just want to talk about high level architectural decisions that the browsers have made that help uh, help ensure that uh, that you know you're, you're you're protected as as you browse around. So. Uh, first thing, though, is that, that, is that the, the reason why this is even an issue is because uh, browsers are extremely complicated. There's, they're a huge code, code base, uh, and they're also network visible, which means you know, it's not, not only is it really complicated, tricky code, but it's actually connected to the internet. So it's const you know, people are constantly sending this code, you know, uh, untrusted input, and trying to break it. Like, this is, this is what attackers do. And so those, that combination of like a really large, compl complicated code base, plus it's connected to the internet, um, and plus it's often written in, in an, on a an unsafe language like C++, that's a really dangerous combination. Um, and then, of course, we also have constantly new features getting added to the browser, so there's all this code churn. Um, so yeah, without a solid architecture, this is basically a recipe for disaster. And it's, it's, it's um, uh, and, and, and actually, um, before Chrome sort of innovated on the browser architecture, browsers were constantly uh, getting attacked with these sort of RCEs, where you could, you could go to a site and your, your entire computer is owned just by visiting a URL. Um, that still happens today, but it happens a lot less because the, the architecture of the browser itself has improved a lot. So we'll talk about that. So, but first, uh, here's like an example of jo JavaScript code doing something it's not supposed to do to completely own your computer. <laughs> Uh, this was discovered by somebody in 2014. Um, uh, so it's, this is just this is just plain JavaScript. This is just running on a, a random site that you ha happen to visit. Like it's not 
privileged or trusted in any way. It's just you know, random JavaScript that could, could be running in your browser. And what this attacker was able to figure out is you can make a buffer in JavaScript that allocates like 32 by, uh, bytes of memory, and then um, you can uh, define a getter. So, so these buffers have this property called byte length, which is supposed to just return however big the buffer is. Um, and it turns out JavaScript uh, you know, has this feature called define getter, which lets you say, like, I'm going to you know, set this, I'm going to change this property into a getter uh, function, and whenever somebody tries to get the property, this function runs and returns whatever it wants to return. And uh, in this case, it's going to return a ginormous number. And, uh, and uh, okay, so, you know, that seems like, you know, okay, that's kind of sketchy. It turns out the C++ code that interacts with this buffer, so this is the code that the you know, Chrome engineers have run, it's running in Chrome, it, when it looks for the byte length, it'll actually invoke this getter and get this as the byte length of the buffer. And so even though it's allocated 32 bytes of memory, it's actually, when it's, when it's um, uh, later interacting with this buffer, it's going to get the new length that the attacker has set it to. And of course, this memory isn't actually allocated to this buffer. It's, this is just whatever memory happens to be in memory. And this is a classic buffer overflow attack. If you've ever taken, you should take CS155, um, you'll learn all about buffer overflows. But this is a buffer overflow uh, 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 you know, this is this is in JavaScript from a completely you know random site that you visited. And so once you have this, what you can literally do is um, here's an example. So we're going 1,000 bytes into this buffer, which you know is only 30, 30 too long, and we can just print out whatever's there. And what we're going to get is whatever happens to be in memory at that location. Uh, similarly, we can write whatever memory we want. And so now by reading and writing, we can literally take over the entire Chrome process and make it do whatever we want. So really bad, right? Does everybody f follow this? Cool. Um, yeah, so this is, there's a lot of extra code to actually get full remote code execution, but this demonstrates the fact that you can read and write whatever memory you want, and you can imagine from there reading, you know, figuring out the, the way the memory is laid out and figuring out how to get RCE from that. And there's actually code here. Um, it's, it's not that many lines of code, but this, this code would, it's right here. Uh, it's like, yeah, six kilobytes of JavaScript. It's really not that much code. But like this little, this little like 200 lines right here would, would basically run whatever commands you wanted to run um, on the user's computer. Um, you would put in the command you want to run somewhere. One of these lines is, is the command you want to run, and then that JavaScript would own them. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's sort of what we're trying to defend against. Yeah? I don't really understand if that works, but would the C++ code need to know that this would be either a value or a function, like the byte length, or is that just sort of? My guess is that there's some abstraction that the, the browser has implemented so that for these types of objects which are shared between the C++ and the JavaScript side, they have some unified way of, like, when they go to get a get when they go to get a property, it will do the right thing. If it's a getter or if it's a property, it'll just give the, it'll give back the value that would be um, visible from the JavaScript side. That's what the C plus plus side would see. So it, it's probably handled. Mm -hmm. Nothing on the C plus plus side. Really pointed. Yeah, I don't think it, you wouldn't see it in the bu buffer code at least. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so so if you're if you're building a browser, the the, the typical way browsers are built for a long time, really long time, was like this. So you you have all these different modules. You know, because you, you're a good programmer, you separate your code into different files, and you have different modules with different responsibilities, blah blah blah. And so you have this process, and it's going to have all the things that the browser does inside it. Uh, and now you know they may be abstracted nicely, but at the end of the day, they're all getting uh, built into like one binary, and it starts up one process, and everything is in that process. And um, uh, yeah, and this is just the way things were done for a long time. Now, um, if you're worried about if you're worried about um, bugs where the um, so this this JavaScript engine here, what it's doing is it's taking strings of JavaScript and figuring out how to interpret them and how to you know it's basically updating some sort of state machine that represents the state of the, of the JavaScript world. Um, if this thing gets tricked and uh, like we just saw in the, on the last slide with this buffer overflow attack. Um, and, um, and now the code that's running the, the JavaScript engine is now like doing what the attacker wants and running instructions from the attacker. This entire process is basically under the control of the attacker, and everything is in this one process, right? And so, uh, so, so yeah, the, the issue is now that now, now the attacker sort of taken over this and can, can, can access all the, all the capabilities of this process. And typically, you're, when you start up your browser, you're starting it up as the user, as, as your user. Whatever user you, account you have on your operating system, that's the same account that this process is running under. And so this process now, you know, it has, it has the ability to read and write all the files that you interact with on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis, everything in your documents folder, um, you know, everything that you, that, you, that you care about, basically. Um, so it's, it's really bad. So, uh, and and, and this, these are some stats about sort of this, this type of memory unsafety bug. It's, it's actually like the main type of vulnerability that, that we still see today. So a recent Microsoft study showed that they found 70% of the vulnerabilities that they addressed through, uh, th through a security update in each year were, um, were memory safety issues. Uh, and then, and this is from Chrome here, this, this is a Chrome stat, so um, 
from out of all of the bugs that they've ever had in Chrome uh, that, that were critical severity, they've had 130 of those, uh, only five of them had nothing to do with memory corruption. So this is the, pr the primary way that, that, uh, that, these, that, these, that you attack a browser today, basically. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Chrome has this nice rule, um, they call it the rule of two, that um, has motivated a lot of their thinking around how to architect the browser. So the rule of two is that you, you have these three things and you can pick any two of them. Um, if you do all three, then you're in trouble. So what are the three things? So one is, um, if you have code that processes untrustworthy input, then that's one of the things. Um, so untrustworthy input is just, um, it's defined as like input that comes from a source that you don't trust. But if, that, if, if the input is like super trivial, it's like very easy to parse it and to look at the code that parses it and be like really confident that it's, that it's correct, then you maybe would, you wouldn't consider this as, as big of an issue. But um, in general, when you're dealing with the browser, you're, you're parsing HTML, you're parsing CSS, you're parsing these really complicated grammars. And so the code is, it's, it's really hard to just look at it and know that it's correct. And the inputs come from untrusted sources. So the web definitely meets this criteria. Okay, the next one is code written in an unsafe language. So that's like anything, assembly, C, C++. Um, safe languages are things like Go, Rust, uh, JavaScript, um, Java. Anything where it, it's impossible for the user to, you know, if the system's working correctly, it's impossible for them to sort of run over uh, uh, the end of a buffer. And so Chrome itself is completely written in C++, so it meets this criteria as well. And so what's the third criteria? The third criteria is um, any code that, is, uh, that has privileged permissions. Um, so this means, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a relative thing. You can, t you, can you know, pr it's, it's a relative, uh, it's relative because Obviously, there's, there's certain things that you have like the utmost privilege on your computer, the bootloader, the firmware, um, the operating system kernel itself. These are all extremely privileged. But um, in the case of the browser, this is running as your user account that you created on your OS. And that's also privileged from browser context because, it, like I said, it can delete all your files. It can read all your files. It can do all kinds of damage. So that's considered privileged. Um, and then anything like less than that would be low privilege. So anyway, so, so any code that sort of can, can do whatever it wants to your computer, we consider that to be a high privilege. Um, code. So in general, any code in Chrome should only do two of these things, not all three. If it does all three, then it's really bad. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it turns out that's actually what they do. So in Chrome itself, they've separated out all the complicated parsing stuff, the stuff that takes untrusted input into this one side over here, and all the stuff that is, uh, that, that, well, it's not a completely precise separation because there's some, there's some overlap. But, um, but you can see here that like, um, typically a lot of the bugs that, that uh, get found in the browser happen to be in these components. Um, so like, uh, do they have image, de yeah, image decoding is on here. So image decoding is a huge source of bugs because image formats are really complicated and images come from the user and the user can craft a special image such that when the, it, when the um, decoder goes to like, read the image, it ends up tr like, tricking the decoder into, into uh, having one of these buffer overflow issues. And so, um, this is like, if you look, just look at the number of security issues th that come from the different components in the browser, it's like the image decoder is way up there, right? So all these stuff, all, the, all these ones that are, that are more likely to have issues are put over here into this left side, and that's what we call the rendering engine, and then the right side is the browser kernel. And so um, let's, yeah, so, so what's the idea here? So the idea is if we can put all this sketchy sort of, well, like not sketchy, but like, <laughs> like, um, error-prone code, code, code where it's, it's mo most likely the security issues are gonna come from into a separate process. Uh, and all the stuff that involves like really sensitive privileged stuff, like reading files from the disk, talking to the network, looking at the user's cookies, and so on in a completely different process. Then if these two processes work together, you can actually get all the same functionality that a browser needs, but if anything goes wrong in one of these processes, this process can be denied the ability to read files, can be denied the ability to do any of these things, and the only way it actually gets to do those things is by talking over an IPC channel, which is an inter-process communication channel. It's just, think of it like a socket between the two processes, and they, they sort of work together to do whatever the browser needs to do. But this one is not trusted. Um, it's assumed that it could go wrong, and if an attacker actually gets control of this process, not that much can happen. So let's look at a picture. This is what uh, comes from the Chrome paper where they introduce this idea. So the browser kernel, when it wants to, uh, when uh, this is actually, by the way, where the where the UI of the browser itself is is controlled. So the the, the URL bar, the the tabs, everything that you interact with is is in this process. So when the user goes to a URL, 
this uh, process will actually go download all of the resources, the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, that the, um, that the renderer is going to need to actually produce a picture of what you see on the page. Um, and it's going to send that over this IPC channel to the rendering engine, which is in a separate process. And that is going to take all that and produce basically an image and send it back to the, the browser kernel, which just shows it on the page. And so you end up with this an architecture like this, where you have basically every different uh, uh, tab in your browser is a separate rendering process, and then you have the one process that controls the browser's UI, talks to the network, and talks to your and controls your, you know reading and writing files on your disk. And these rendering processes can't do any of that stuff. They have to basically ask this process to do it for them. And so the idea is, if an attacker takes over this process by breaking out of the JavaScript engine or finding a bug in the HTML renderer or the image decoder, then the damage they can do is limited. And the other side benefit of this is that if one of these tabs happens to crash, not because of a malicious you know, issue from an attacker, but just because there's a bug, um, then that renderer process crashes, but the entire browser doesn't crash because the renderer process is just responsible for a single tab. And so that's if you've ever seen the oh snap, you know, thing in Chrome, that's, that's because that, that, that renderer process has crashed. But the entire browser and all the other tabs are OK. Um, of course, uh, the way things used to be before was that uh, <laughs> was that, uh, you, that the, the way that it worked before is literally inter, in, Internet Explorer and every other browser would literally have uh, a single process for the entire browser. So if, if there's a bug in a single tab, then, uh, <laughs> sorry, I had fun with this. <laughs> if there's a bug in a single tab, then uh, that, would, uh, that, would, that would take the entire browser down. You'd lose all your work and all your tabs. Uh, and so it actually, there was, there was, a, there was a, for a while, there was literally, it was a way possible to crash Internet Explorer with this single line right here, input type crash. Uh, and that would, that would just take down your whole browser. So if you wanted to be mean, you'd put this on your blog, and then th the user would just lose all their, all their work. And they didn't have, like, restore your session or any of that kind of stuff in those days. It was just gone. Um, so yeah, the multi-process architecture is just good for other reasons besides security. It's just good for, like, robustness. Um, so yeah, again, just to reiterate, render processes can't access the disk, network, or devices. And Chrome runs them in a restricted sandbox to limit the damage that um, attackers can cause. Um, and um, it also has the side benefit of allowing web pages to run in parallel, because now you have parallelism via the multiple processes. And also, the browser can continue to run if a tab crashes and the user doesn't lose their work. So that's great. Um, the other big thing that browsers uh, did, again, again, Chrome was the innovator here initially, and but now all the browsers do it, is uh, auto-update. So uh, there, before this was a thing, software generally didn't auto-update. It usually prompted and nagged the user to update. And then Chrome just said, we're not even going to have an option to, for the user to sort of say yes or no. We're just going to update their browser for them, and they can't turn it off. And that was extremely controversial at the time, but now it's considered standard practice, and nobody thinks it's a bad idea. Um, and the, this is actually this is really a kind of cool idea. The initial version of the browser was when they started the project up, they started with an auto updater and nothing else. So they literally had a white a window that popped. It was a white screen that had nothing in it, but all it had was the auto updater code. And the idea was that all the people in the company and the open source people who were following the development of this project, they could install this, you know fake, this non-working non browser, but it had an auto-updater. And then over time, as they, as they opened it up, it would develop into a browser, um, you know, start to do more things. Uh, and so, so that, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. It started as a blank window and sort of over time became and grew into a browser. Yeah? Did you download that today and watch it? <laughs> that's a cool idea. I don't know. So typically, um, they delete the, the binaries. You can't even find old versions of Chrome um, online anymore. But like there, I think there are third-party sites that try to save them. Um, and, but I do think it would probably like skip ahead a lot. It, it might not just like go, you know, one version at a time. Um, there are cool videos on YouTube of people installing like Windows 3.1 or something, like the very first version of Windows, and then updating it to like Windows 95, and then to Windows 98, and then to Windows 2000, and they go all the way up to Windows 10, and like it, it works. Um, <laughs> that's what that reminded me of. But but yeah, I, I don't know if you could do that with Chrome. Um, yeah. So so there are some limitations though of this architecture. So one um, issue is that. Chrome would like to be able to place pages from different origins into different pro render processes, but it's difficult to do that. So what ends up happening, what they ended up doing was every tab is a separate process, but tabs can be composed of content from many different sites, right? You can have a site with an iframe in it, it comes from another, another site. So you actually end up having like three or four different sites, JavaScript, all running in the same process, right? This isolation is giving us, you know, it's giving us, it's separating the browser kernel from the tabs that compose the sites, but within a tab, you still have multiple sites in the same process. Does that make sense? Because a site, you know, a site might load resources and images and different things from different sites. Okay, 
I, I don't know if people, I see confused faces. People, are people getting this? Maybe a picture helps. Um, yeah, I'll do that in a second. Uh, actually, no, let's just, let's just do it now. So, so the idea is, um, uh, so the, 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 the ar what, what, what the architecture gives us is if you have a renderer process that talks to the browser process over IPC, and this is now loading up evil.com, um, okay, great, you know, this is, you know, now if evil.com manages to break out of the JavaScript sandbox and now take over this entire process on your computer, it can't read files on your disk and, and it can't, you know, can't uh, do stuff like that because it has to go talk to the browser process, which will presumably not let it do what it wants to do. But uh, there's still a lot of damage that the site can do. For example, say that it loads an iframe uh, that's victim.com. Now, this means that in order for this renderer process to actually do its job, which is to draw the page, this, pa this, this process now needs to load the cookies for victim.com because that's part of what it needs to actually draw the page. It's going to need to know, it's going to need to see that, right? This content, you know, uh, came from victim.com and so therefore this process has access to it. Now, if the JavaScript sandbox is working correctly, you know, the same origin policy will be enforced. So evil.com won't be able to talk to, uh, won't be able to read these cookies because all that, that same origin policy is enforced within this process. Right? The damage happens if evil.com manages to find a bug in the browser itself and break out of, it basically, now it has control of the entire process and now it doesn't have to follow the same origin policy anymore. Right? And so the damage is here that it can read the cookies, it can read anything that managed to get into the renderer process's memory because now it's, it's basically owned this process. Um, it, sure, it can't like, read files on your disk, but that's still quite bad. Right? Okay. So um, the other issue is uh, that we, a few years ago, people discovered, uh, I don't know, actually I don't know how long ago it's been, but there's a thing called Spectre, which we definitely don't have time to talk about here. But it's a, uh, essentially it's an issue that breaks down the boundaries between processes. So it turns out an attacker can read memory from other processes and sort of completely violate the, pr the process um, model of, 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 of modern operating systems. Um, and um, it turns out that, uh, what we have going on here within this renderer process is even, it's, it's also vulnerable to Spectre because we don't even have a process boundary here between evil.com and victim.com. These are actually in the same process and we're relying on code uh, you know, that's written uh, to actually keep the boundary between them separate. It's, it's, you know, the, the JavaScript uh, VM is basically trying to keep this, 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 this boundary here, but it turns out um, an attacker, what an attacker can do is, um, so there's this renderer process that has all this sensitive information in it, and it also has the, it needs to run the code from evil.com. And so what evil.com does is it writes some JavaScript that takes advantage of these Spectre issues in, in CPUs. And what it does is it can, using completely valid JavaScript, using no sort of, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not taking advantage of a bug or a security issue in Chrome, it's literally valid JavaScript, but they can basically read memory from other parts of the process that they're not supposed to be able to read. And that's one of the things that Spectre, um, Enables. Okay, so that's really bad. So one of the things that Chrome wanted to do to fix this, th th does this make sense by the way? Okay, cool. So, so there's a solution to this. Um, the idea is it's called site isolation. And so the idea is that what if instead of isolating, uh, just isolating every tab in a separate process, what if we took every single different site and put it in a separate process? So if a, if a tab happens to load content from five sites, then we're going to have five processes. And they're all going to be responsible for loading the, their part, and then we're going to stitch it together and, and uh, draw it as, as sort of one, one final result. Uh, so then the cool thing is if we do that, then now the browser knows um, that when it sees a renderer, uh, yeah, so here's, here, let me go back to this really quickly. So in this situation, this renderer process, the browser doesn't know what resources this may need to load. Because, you know, there could be an iframe that loads something from victim.com and it might load something from another site. So basically, when this, when this uh, renderer asks the browser to go and download stuff from victim.com or to give it the victim.com cookies, this browser process has to do it because it doesn't know whether this renderer process is, like, um, compromised or not. It, it, it would ask the, it potentially might ask for the cookies for victim.com in a legitimate case, right? That's, that's totally fine because we're relying on the same origin policy inside the renderer process to keep the two separate. Um, so the, from the browser's perspective, it can't treat, it, it, can't, it can't know whether this, if this, pro, pro, if this process is compromised, it can't know sort of how to behave. But if instead what we do is, we basically, what we say is we take every um, site and we put it in its own separate process sandbox, then what we can do is, um, so evil.com is going to load over here, and evil.com is going to iframe this victim site. But it turns out that um, the, the victim site's actually loading over here, 
and um, nothing from evil.com is loading over here. And, and what happens is um, the, the browser process can sort of uh, take the results of the, sort of the pictures that each of these drew for their part of the page and stitch it together itself. And, and so that means that now the browser can know that this renderer should never get content for any other site except for evil.com. So it will literally label this like IPC pipe right here. It'll label it as belonging to evil.com, and it will label this one as belonging to victim.com. And now these are not allowed to ask for anything that are not related to their own um, site. So for example, if, the, if this renderer process said, hey, I need the cookies for victim.com, and ask the browser process that, the browser process would say, no, I'm not going to give that to you. You're the renderer for, for uh, evil.com. OK, and then so of course now like, it can access evil.com data, and it can, it can load uh, scripts from other sites. So that's the thing keep, to keep in mind. This evil.com still should be allowed to load images from other sites and other kinds of content like that. And it should be able to load, uh, um, well, it shouldn't be able to load data like cookies. But it may, if the headers are right, be able to load the data if the headers say that, that like, for example, if there's a course header, then uh, on this response, it's possible that, you know, that, that the browser should actually allow it to go through because that response is tagged as being allowed to be readable by anybody, right? So that's enforced now in the browser process instead of within the renderer process. So basically, if these get compromised, they can't, they can't read data from other sites. That's the, that's the sort of TLDR here. Um, cool. So um, I wonder if I should just skip this. It's kind of, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip this. Um, well, OK, maybe I'll show the picture for it, and, and you can get an intuitive idea for this. So um, so like I mentioned, like evil.com should be allowed to load images from victim.com, right? I mean, that's a thing it's allowed to do. Um, and so uh, what happens here is that um, so if evil.com decides to do a fetch from evil.com, uh, that's allowed because it's the same origin, right? That's fine. Um, if it tries to load an image from another site, the victim site, we should allow that as well. So if, if this renderer asks the main process for an image from another site, the browser should actually allow it. That's totally allowed, right? Um, but what happens if it asks for an HTML page um, and tries to put in an image tag? Now, this is not going to load. You know, this is not going to load as a valid image. And of course, the same origin policy is not going to let the page actually read, um, read the contents of this page out. But it would be bad if it could ask the main process for this information, because now the data gets into the renderer process's memory. And we're concerned about Spectre, and we're concerned about the, the renderer becoming completely compromised. And so we actually don't want this data to make it into the renderer process. So the browser actually has to have some smarts about, like, oh, this is actually an HTML page. This can never load in an image. And it's going to error out anyway. So rather than sending the data into this renderer process, which may be compromised, and then be able to read the data, we're going to reject this request. That's the idea. So this thing is called, uh, uh, it's called CORB, cross-origin read blocking. Um, and it's, it's kind of subtle. So it, the details aren't that important. But this is the main idea. Yeah. Ah, OK, cool. So let me see how much time am I on track? I'm not on track. Wow, OK. I'm going to have to go fast. Um, so I want to switch to a, uh, a, a new thing. So we're going to talk about secure coding. And I'm going to try and leave you with just some tips to think about as you enter the world and keep write, you know, start writing apps and working at companies and writing a bunch of code that is going into production. Um, so um, one thing we didn't focus too much on, but I mentioned at the beginning, is JavaScript itself has a lot of rough edges as a language. Everybody likes to make fun of it. Um, it's mostly fair. Um, sometimes not fair, but mostly fair. Uh, and um, so just a few of these issues, uh, just uh, you've probably seen some of this stuff. But um, so one issue in the language itself is that the, the double equals operator is actually not doing like uh, the kind of equality that you would expect. It does this weird coercion using an algorithm called abstract equality comparison algorithm, which is very not intuitive. You can go read the spec. It's, it's not possible to remember what it actually does. So if you try to write a function called uh, is 0 here and see if the argument is 0, uh, you'll actually find out that all those are 0, um, which is not what you want, probably. Uh, and so the solution to this is to always use triple equals in your code. And um, if you do that, then you get what you expect. Right? You get, it actually checks that the type is the same first before it checks the value. Um, whereas before, what it was doing was sort of turning this into a string and then comparing it, because one side was a string and one side was a number, which is not what you want. Um, another really terrible issue is that um, if you duplicate the function arguments, like you have two arguments that are named A, 
um, this should probably just be a syntax error or something. But instead, no, actually, the second A will take precedence over the first one. And this is probably a bug, but um, you won't know until, um, I don't know, until some, it causes some problem in your code base. And so uh, the solution here is you should, there's this thing called strict mode that you can enable in your code. And you do this by just including a string at the top of your file that's, that contains the, the words use space strict. And if you do that, then um, the um, entire JavaScript, JavaScript language actually changes and it, it, it gets a little bit stricter and uh, it fixes some of the rough edges of JavaScript itself. So um, in this case, what it would do is it, as soon as you, um, you wrote this code, you get a syntax error saying the, duplicate, the, 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 the parameter name has been duplicated. So it's probably worth doing this in your code. Um, so um, yeah, you, you add that string and then you sort of opt into a more restricted version of JavaScript. Um, it, it's not a subset, it actually, it actually has different semantics. So for example, silent errors like what you saw before on the previous slide become uh, errors that actually throw exceptions. Um, and it also fixes uh, some sort of performance issues. So the other thing you can do to fix this is to use a linter. Uh, ESLint is the most popular JavaScript linter, and it has like all these hundreds of configurable rules that you can use to sort of say like, anytime I do this in my code, please yell at me so that I don't do it. Um, and if you don't want to like define all these rules yourself, you can install a preset. There's a whole bunch of different options of sort of predefined configurations uh, that you can just install. And uh, I recommend standard. I'm biased because I made standard. But um, if you install standard, um, it will. Uh, you can just run one command, standard, and then it will sort of. Uh, has a reasonable set of things that it will warn you about, both sort of formatting things, but also like errors in your code. Um, it also has an automatic fixer that you can run that will attempt to sort of fix whatever issues it can for you. So it'll switch the double equals to a triple equals, for example, and fix and you know save you from that error. Um, here's another thing. So this is uh, you can have an object with duplicated uh, keys, key names, which is silly because the second one is going to take precedence anyway. Um, turns out this is actually not fixable by using use strict. You actually have to use a linter to, fi to catch this because it turns out uh, that they added a feature to JavaScript that lets you sort of dynamically at runtime set a key name by, by using a variable. And it's possible that this will end up resolving to bar, which will be duplicated. And it can't know that until it runs the code. And so, uh, and so basically, th there's no way that, they, can, that they, they can't consider that an error um, f for, um, for that reason. Here's another one that actually can crash servers a lot. Um, so, if you're getting, Java, uh, getting JSON objects from the user, it's possible that the user will name um, one of the properties in the object the same as a name that's actually on, um, that's on all objects. So all objects in JavaScript have this thing called has own property, which lets you basically ask if this is a, if this is a property on the object. Like, does this exist? It's going to return true or false. Uh, but if they put has own property in their own object, then that will actually take precedence over the, the, the sort of has own property that's being inherited from the the object superclass. And so they'll actually crash your server <laughs> by doing that. Um, yeah, so that's not good. So you can catch that by, um, again, using a linter. Um, uh, but another, th another sort of solution to this is you can um, just use the has on property directly from the object superclass and then call it uh, with the object itself as the sort of first argument. Um, then you're sort of, you're guaranteeing that you're running this function. Um, yeah, and this is actually, it looks much grosser, but it actually will be more robust. Here's another one. So JavaScript has a sort of anti-feature that you may have heard about called automatic semicolon insertion. And the idea behind this was uh, it's a um, feature meant to help beginner programmers like have their code work, even if f they forget to terminate their lines with semicolons. And so what will happen is in most cases, if you just hit new line, you just make a new line, you hit enter, that will actually be fine. It will insert a semicolon for you there, except in these cases. <laughs> so it's not a perfect solution. So for example, here, what it'll, what it'll do is, let me see if I can use this instead. Yeah, there we go. So well, here what it'll do is it'll actually interpret this as a function invocation. So it's going to call a function called bar with that uh, with the number one as an argument. Um, so it actually is like, no, we can't put a semicolon there. That actually is the continuation of the previous line. And that might surprise you. Same thing with this one, that with this one being an array index right here of the, of the string world. Um, this will end up being foo divided by regex. <laughs> which is not what you want. Uh, and then here, uh, so by the way, inserting semicolons on the end of every line doesn't actually protect you. You might think, well, I'm not going to rely on this feature. I'm going to insert semicolons everywhere, and then I'll be good, right? Um, turns out, so if you wrote this line, right, th this function right here, um, where would the semicolon go? It would go here, right? Because that's the end of the, the statement. But 
automatic semicolon insertion is going to say, wait a minute, you hit enter here, I'm going to stick a semicolon right there for you. And so you end up getting return and then an object afterwards that does nothing. <laughs> uh, so it turns out, yeah, inserting semicolons everywhere doesn't actually protect you. You have to understand the rules, which is just, it's just bad. It's just, it's a mistake. They shouldn't have included it in the language. The creator says it was a mistake. Everyone agrees it was a mistake. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, if you actually fix, you know, you actually put semicolons everywhere, you'll actually get, you'll get owned in this situation. It's not actually a perfect solution. The only, the only guaranteed solution is you have to use a linter. A linter can help you catch this, because what it'll do is it'll say, wait a minute, um, I know a semicolon's gonna go here, and I see that you have unused code that is never gonna run afterwards, and it can warn you about this. So you have to always use a linter in the real world. Um, yeah, okay. Um, let's see here, yeah, so that's what I'm just showing it, standard would warn you in both of those cases, whether you insert semicolons or you don't, it's gonna catch it, and so you have unreachable code. Uh, let's see here, yeah, okay. Um, Yeah, actually, so I lied a little bit. It turns out this will, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what happened here. This is gonna be um, uh, a block, and that's a label, and then that's the number one. Yeah, it's like, if you it's like there. yeah, it's like you can go to apples now. You can add a go-to statement if you want, and it'll jump you there, but yeah. Anyway, actually, JavaScript doesn't have go-tos, but yeah, same idea, okay. Yeah, okay, so what are the things, like, it turns out, yeah, you can add leading zeros to numbers, and that actually turns them into octal numbers instead of decimal numbers. So, like, that's eight and that's nine, and except for if you use a digit like nine, which happens to not be a valid digit in octal, then it ignores the zero and gives you 99. So, anyway, this is dumb. Um, <laughs> uh, you, should, uh, you should use a linter to catch this if you accidentally do it, um, and, or um, use strict mode, because strict mode also prevents octal numbers from working. Um, yeah, another thing that happens, again, this is like another thing where it was a decision that was made to make the language easier for beginners, um, it turns out to be a mistake, is if you forget to include a declaration before you define a variable, so you don't say like, you forget let or const, then what will happen is it'll, it'll make x and y a global variable. So <laughs> if you call foo here, then this function runs, and then when foo is finished, x and y still exist because they're globals, and so this will actually print out five and 10. Okay, so that's just, that's just bad. So if you, again, if you, if you use strict mode or you use a linter, this will be caught. Um, the difference is if you, use a, if you use strict mode, you need to actually, um, it's a runtime, it'll be a runtime error because it won't know until it calls this function that until it gets to this line and then it'll be like, wait a minute, that's not valid. Um, so uh, if you use a linter, you can actually catch this before you even run your code, which is kind of nice. Uh, oh yeah, this is a really fun one. This used to be valid. You could actually, in the past, you could do undefined equals true, and then every program would break. <laughs> um, this doesn't work anymore, um, but if you try to do something like that, um, you'll, get a, you'll get a type error, if you, again, if you use strict mode or you use a linter. So I'm just trying to give you the idea that like, there's all these edge cases, there's all these like, gross things, and it's not, you know, it's not just JavaScript. A lot of languages have these kinds of, sort of you know, tricky little edge cases, and um, using a linter or some kind of a static analysis tool to catch issues is really, really valuable. Uh, oh yeah, another similar one. Uh, we can, we can. Yeah, I'll just show you really quick. You can do like you can try to add a property to to a primitive like true or to a number, um, and that won't work. Um, by the way, the reason why I'm putting a semicolon here, does anyone know? It's it's ridiculous. So in the in the no semicolon style, you can either write semicolons in your code or you cannot write semicolons. If you don't if you don't write them, then when you when you do something like this where you have the parens, remember I mentioned how the, what the parens will do? They'll be treated as a function invocation on the previous line. So the way that you can fix that issue is you add a semicolon, but in a no semicolon code style, you don't want to put semicolons at the end of lines on some lines and not on other lines. So what you do instead is you prefix the semicolon <laughs> only, when, only, when you have, uh, uh, only when you have one of these, these weird characters starting a line. It turns out there's only a handful of them, so you just memorize, oh, paren uh, and square bracket, I'll just remember to put semicolons basically. But yeah, it's, 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 it's not good. So use a linter, uh, yeah, so, so you'll end up, if you use strict mode or use a linter, you'll again catch this as a, you're trying to add a property to a, to a primitive. You can't do that. So basically, use a linter. You can use standard or you can use ESLint, but I don't recommend coding without one of these. Um, one of these. Uh, and standard just uses ESLint under the hood, so ESLint is what you need to use um, to, uh, to be safe. Yeah, and then, of course, the general advice I've been giving sort of all quarter is to not be too clever for your own good because code is for humans and not for computers. Uh, so, uh, like... This is some code that uh, I've seen people write, and I've written it myself, uh, but I now no longer think this is good code. So what you have here is, a, a, is foo is a, is a Boolean, 
um, you have a function bar, and then you can, you can sort of do this, take advantage of short circuit uh, Boolean evaluation, and you can, uh, you can basically rely on the fact that um, if this is false, then the interpreter doesn't bother uh, running bar because it knows the entire um, Boolean is going to evaluate to a falsy or to, to false. So, uh, and if this is true, then this will run. And like, you can do this. It's not the end of the world in this case, but like, in general, this type of programming is like, I think, trying to be too clever. Um, and this is much like simpler to understand if you just write if foo bar. Um, like this, everybody who sees this, who's ever programmed before, will understand this. Whereas this relies on understanding, you know, the rules of of, of uh, the logical operators and short circuit evaluation. So you know, you could argue a good, good programmers should know this. Maybe that's true. But um, if you're working on a team and you have beginners on the team, you know, this is the code that, that everyone on your team will understand. This is code that you know some percentage of your team may not understand or will have to look up stuff. I um, mean, this is this isn't the worst example, so I wouldn't begrudge you too much if you did this. But um, there's like there's kind of, this stuff is all over. If you you know you start to look at real world code, people are really always trying to be really clever. Like this is something that I've seen. So this is I didn't I had to like I had to go in like I spent like 15 minutes trying to understand what this did. Like it's too clever. Th that just means it's too clever in my opinion. So wh what this is doing is. Um, it's helpful if you add parens. So first of all, I didn't expect the parens to, to go that way. I thought the parens, I thought that the dot 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 would attach to this, and then this would be separate. But it turns out, no, this is actually how it binds, which is, which is uh, not expected. And then what's actually going on here is it's, it's basically, so if the condition turns out to be false, then the whole, this whole statement becomes false, and you get this. Um, and then if it, if it turns out that this is true, then you get this as the value. And so you get dot dot dot, and then the right-hand side. And then what dot 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 does is it sort of expands if this is an object, it expands. Uh, it sort of takes all the um, uh, keys, it uh, takes all the properties off of the object and assigns them to this object with this value. So ba basically, this is the code. It's, it, this is this left and right. So that's what they wrote. This is what they could have written. So basically, what they should have written is just make an object. If the condition is true, assign value to the prop property. Instead, they wrote that, which is like requires understanding a bunch of features and knowing how the, where the parens go and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, I think it's too clever. Yeah. I even nowadays I try to avoid that, but it's a preference issue. Like, I, I mean, I wouldn't do it because <laughs> I'm like relentlessly trying to just like go back to like using just the very basics of the language whenever I can, unless there's like some really good reason not to. But yeah, that's a that's a taste thing. Um, this is like a very, very bad example. I, you can't justify this one. The first case, the programmer is clearly flexing and trying to like show off, like, uh, oh, I know how function.prototype.call works and that, you know, all this stuff. They should have just written this. Oh, we're just going to map over some names and trim off the extra white space on both sides. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's like, there's just no justification for this kind of code. Um, yeah. So don't be overly clever. Readability is much more important than brevity, I think. Um, and like, don't. In general, try not to write code that requires like um, all of your intelligence to write because um, like when you go and look at it later, you're not going to necessarily have all that same context that you have now. So if you are as p clever as you possibly can be in this moment to write like this code, um, like later on when you're tired or later on when you have less context, you're not even going to understand your own code, let alone other people who 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 you know are coming along. So. Um, so yeah, don't, I, I'd say don't try to go out of your way to use esoteric features unless you're really getting bang for your buck in using them. Um, and definitely don't rely on like obscure edge cases in the language if you can. Um, and I think it's actually similar to writing where like, you know, I don't know what, what, what again, it's like a taste thing, so I'm, I'm hesitant to be so, to sort of be absolutist about it, but like, personally, when I read writing that uses like really flowery words, like when they could have just used a simpler word and been, underst and been understood by more people, I'm a little bit, Annoyed, like unless I'm going out of my, unless I'm trying to read writing for the art, like if it's if you're trying to communicate a message, like the more complicated words you throw in there, you're just losing more of your audience. So it depends on what your goals are, but and some people do really think that that coding, you know, they are coding for art reasons, like they're just trying to have fun and like that's fine. I've seen people, uh, I've seen somebody do. Has anyone heard of reverse indentation? It's hilarious. Basically, you start uh, the first line starts at the most uh, indented that you're going to use in your program, and every time you would normally indent to the right, you indent to the left, so that it's an inverted, uh, like it's it's ridiculous. Don't do it. But if you're trying to like, you know what I mean? Like you, you can do whatever you want. Like if you think if it's if programming is art, you know, like have go at it. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, yeah. And then last thing is, um, I think writing tests is super critical because if you don't test your code, it probably almost certainly doesn't work. 
uh, untested code is broken code, so write tests. <laughs> if you just write it and look at it and think it's good, it's probably not good. Like, test it, for sure. Um, cool. So, uh, last, uh, I guess, yeah, the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is, uh, so, yeah, so we've talked about writing tests, we've talked about not being clever, we've talked about sort of using a linter, um, uh, we've talked about all the different web security things over the quarter. Um, the last thing is, uh, we end up, when we're writing programs, we end up using a lot of code written by other people. Um, we pull in a bunch of code that's open source, that's written by other people. Um, the typical NPM app, I mean, if you install a few dependencies, you end up with like a thousand packages in your dependency tree very quickly. And each of those might be worked on by several contributors, and so you end up implicitly depending upon thousands of individuals that you've never met, uh, that you, in, you know, you're, you're running code that you haven't read, um, and you're just hoping that it all works. And honestly, it's kind of amazing that most of the time it actually works as well as it does because, I mean, <laughs> we've talked about security the whole quarter, but all of you every day when you run npm install are literally just giving shell to like a thousand random people you have no idea who, you know, and like on the same computer that has all of your like tax information and private information, it's all on there. And like, I mean, I do this every day too. It's ridiculous. I can't believe we all do it, but that, <laughs> that is literally how it works uh, right now. Um, so yeah, there's this, it's, it's called the open source supply chain. It's like this idea is like when you're building a product, you're actually depending upon all these uh, vendors and people who supply the sort of raw materials that you end up producing, using to produce a final product. And in the case of open source, it's um, the, the, this, uh, this, these supplies are produced by, uh, by these open source contributors, these volunteers, often unpaid, um, often, you know, like in other countries, you don't know who they are. Um, and so, um, the types of risks that can come from building your applications this way are, I think, I put them into these three categories. You can have accident, accidental mistakes that the, um, the, the open source developers make. You can have just like a lack of resources. Like you have often, you know, volunteers who don't have enough time to actually actively maintain their packages. So you end up with unmaintained packages, literally code that's just been abandoned that no one is, um, no one is looking after and no one is, um, there's no one you can email to sort of say, hey, I found a security issue in this. Please fix it because everyone who's using it is vulnerable. If you email the, the person, they're not there. Like they've moved on to other things or maybe they're not a programmer anymore. Maybe they died. Like there's all kinds of things, p p things happen, right? So uh, those are unmaintained and there's also undermaintained packages which are just packages that where um, the maintainer doesn't have enough time to devote to regularly. Like they're still around, but they're not actively working on it and giving it the love and attention that it needs. And then lastly, there's just malice. Like either um, a maintainer, um, an open source maintainer goes rogue, uh, which has happened in the NPM ecosystem. Somebody uh, literally just deleted all their code and then everything that depended upon it instantly broke and like no one got work done that day because uh, literally there's like packages that were dependent upon that were just missing. Um, uh, and then there's also just like people get their accounts hacked and stuff like that. So just a few, a few examples just to give you a taste. So this was um, a, uh, you know, actually forget what the project did, but there, huh, what was it? Uh, it's called Bumblebee, I think. Bumblebee, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah so this, <laughs> this was, uh, this was an install script that, run, that ran, I think, at the time you installed the package. And you'll notice there's a space here. And what does RM do when you have multiple arguments? <laughs> it treats them as separate folders to be deleted. And so this install script would literally just delete your entire slash user folder, which is where like all your binaries are and like a bunch of operating system files. So everybody who installed this update just like their machines got hosed. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and like this was not malicious. This was literally an honest mistake that the maintainer made. But like tons of users' computers just got completely destroyed and they, hopefully they had backups. Yeah, like one, one character. Like can you imagine how bad you would feel if you did this? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then the comments are always the worst on GitHub when people start piling on and like, you know, like, I mean, these are kind of funny, but there's sometimes they can get really nasty. Um, and then um, this is another big one, Heartbleed, maybe you've heard of it. Um, oh, it turns out OpenSSL, which is uh, the library that I think more, the majority of, of TLS uh, uh, packages use. Uh, so this is you know used in, in most you know a lot of browsers and a lot of servers to actually negotiate the TLS handshake and to do all the TLS protocol. This was actually maintained by one person. Um, for most of its life. And um, after, so there was this huge bug that everyone discovered like in 2017 called Heartbleed. And when this happened, people started looking at the project and saying, you know, how did this happen? You know, what was the, what was the issue? And then it came out that like uh, the, the, so the, the, the OpenSSL maintainer said that they received $2,000 in donations every year. And there's one person who works on it full time. So <laughs> yeah, and this is the code that powers the majority of every TLS connection on the internet like this is this is ridiculous like this is really ridiculous <laughs> uh and now after, so after this happened like all the companies sort of finally came in and were like okay i guess we'll give you money to like maintain this thing that like we all use for our billion dollar businesses um anyway sorry i feel p very passionately about this but 
Uh, and then there's another example, curl. I mean, you, you've all used curl. Curl is built into like every uh, Linux distribution. It's in like most IoT devices. It's in like every t like a lot of TVs and smartphones. It's in a lot of stuff. And um, it turns out there's like one guy who's been working on it for 20 years as a hobbyist. And uh, he just recently went full time working on it now. So he quit his job. Uh, but uh, yeah, curl, I mean, it's actually maintained by a person who just like works on it and it powers like everything. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty wild. <laughs> uh, and he's now accepting donations on GitHub uh, so you can support him. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, and then, so th that, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about sort of under-maintained packages, right? Um, so you have, the you have the accidental problems, you have the under-maintained packages, and then here you have the actual malice. So what happened here was um, there's a guy named Dominic who maintains uh, and wrote and maintains a whole bunch of packages in the Node ecosystem. Um, uh, he, uh, he's sort of, he, he has like, I think 700 packages that he's written. A lot of them are, are not maintained, obviously. It's just too much for one person, but he's a very experimental person, publishes a lot of work. And it turns out one of his packages that got really popular, he, he's not using it anymore. So you can see here, he sort of moved on to another thing and moved on to another thing. And he doesn't use this code anymore in his own projects. But a lot of companies were continuing to use it, even though he's like moved on past it. And uh, so somebody emailed him. And this is very common in the open source world. Somebody will email a maintainer and say, hey, I noticed that you, know, you haven't been merging the pull requests that people are sending you. Um, I happen to be a user of the software. Do you mind if like, I help out? And then you know, if they help out a little bit, eventually um, somebody like this who's completely overwhelmed with work will just give that person the ability to commit to the project and to publish new versions of the package. And that's how the, world, like, that's how the open source world works. It's based on, based on a lot of trust. And if you show up and you do work, you're going to be given uh, responsibility and per permission to publish. And so that's what happened. Somebody emailed him and said, hey, you know, I'm using this. And he you know, he's, hasn't used it for four years. And he, so he said, yeah, sure, you can publish to it. The person um, ended up adding malware to it that was very sneaky. So it was, it was, um, it was uh, an encrypted string. So it didn't look like code. It was just an encrypted string that got decrypted at runtime and then evaluated. And it, it would actually, well, the, the really tricky thing was the decryption key to decrypt it was based on the parent package that it was within. So for most people, when you're just installing this on your computer, it will look up one level in the tree and then take whatever, uh, it, it would take the description of the package above it and then use that as the decryption key. But for most, most of us, it would, that would be an, an invalid decryption key and it would do nothing. But in one particular case, the, who they, were, they, were, they, were, they were targeting a Bitcoin wallet. And this Bitcoin wallet, they knew exactly what package was above it in the, in the, in the dependency tree. And so they made that be the decryption key. And so because of that, no one noticed this. It was sort of very targeted. It was only targeting one particular user, which is this Bitcoin wallet. And what the code did was it would look at the balance in the wallet. And if it was over, I think, like some huge amount of Bitcoin, then it would uh, send the keys off to the attacker. And so they stole a whole bunch of Bitcoin by doing this. Um, yeah, and I mean, this person was like, you know, uh, uh, you know, obviously didn't intend to give the code to, didn't intend to give their package to this malicious actor. They were just overworked and like, you know, this could have happened to serve any maintainer. It's very possible. Um, yeah, but I recommend reading this post. This is sort of his statement afterwards where he talks about, um, he's a very interesting person. He talks about how he used to be a dishwasher at a restaurant and how, you know, anyway, it's a very interesting <laughs> person. Um, this also is true in the, in the case of um, the browser extension ecosystem. So you see a similar dynamics as the open source world. So all the browser extensions that you use, oftentimes they're written by individuals. And what happens is uh, there are these um, sketchy actors that, that email uh, people who created popular Chrome extensions and say, you know, hey, I noticed that you, know, you wrote this extension that a million people installed, and I noticed that you're, you know, you're not really actively working on it anymore. Um, what do you say if I sent you 50K? Uh, would you, you know, give it to us? We're a company. We're going to develop it further. And somebody who, you know, is like, oh, I wrote this little thing in my free time, and like, oh, 50k, yeah, sounds good. And so they'll give the the rights to the extension to this company, and the company will turn around and put malware or collect data about your browsing activity, and and so on and so forth. So the the, the sort of uh, the owner of the extension changes, and the, the the behavior of it can change dramatically. Um, and this is just because it's really hard to monetize Chrome extensions, and so you get this sort of kind of uh, like acts of desperation almost in a way where people will sort of give over control of it to, to someone who will pay them for it because they're making nothing from it. Um, so yeah, this is a big sort of problem in both the open source and the, and the, the, the browser extension ecosystems, in my opinion. Okay, that was a lot. So con to conclude, I just wanted to highlight um, a few of the key ideas we talked about in the class over the quarter. So these are the big ideas. Uh, think like an attacker. Um, hopefully, when you're writing code, you're not thinking uh, that everything is going to go well and you're going to be given exactly the inputs that you expect. Think, like, how is this going to be broken? And also, think this way when you're reading other people's code. 
people on your team or your, your teammates or, or just code you find online. Um, it, it's a mindset that will serve you well uh, through your career. Uh, of course, never trust user input. Always sanitize it. Uh, use defense in depth, so be redundant. Assume that one of your security controls is going to fail and think about what will happen in that situation. Plan ahead. Um, salt and hash your passwords. If you don't want to bother doing it yourself, just use bcrypt. That's the good advice. Just use bcrypt. Um, beware of ambient authority. So that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the way that the browser will helpfully attach cookies to requests that are destined for a certain site. You can solve this with same site cookies. Be sure to use those. Don't be overly clever. Uh, it's better to be explicit than to be magical when you're writing code. So um, I will take boring, plain, repetitive, explicit code any day over magical code, even though magical code is fun sometimes. But like for security, explicit code is, is usually better. Um, Dangerous code should look dangerous. So if something is very uh, risky to use, make sure it has a scary name. Make sure it's properly documented. Um, don't combine it with um, functions that do benign things. Don't put those two things together. Uh, and then, of course, you can never be too paranoid. In security, uh, a paranoid mindset is actually a very valuable uh, asset. So be, be constantly vigilant. Um, cool. So um, I wanted to, um, well, yeah, I guess questions about any of anything. <laughs> yeah. Is there like some equivalent where it's like your answer 20 years ago that was solved by like somebody working with Ubuntu or Debian or something and we just forgot the solution or is like the scale just totally different now? Or, like, yeah. It's, so there's a several things that have changed. We can talk, talk about this forever. It's a really interesting issue. But like one big thing that's changed is that the size of packages that people produce are a lot smaller because modern programming languages like and NPM is made you know relatively recently and didn't have a package manager and you know Node didn't have a package manager until like I don't know five years ago or something. Uh, Rust is also just created a, a new package manager. All these new ecosystems um, have sort of solved the traditional dependency hell that happens in other ecosystems. So I don't know if you've ever tried to install a Python package and then it says, oh, like you have a dependency this conflicts with, and it turns out like you know. Uh, this package needs version one of, the, of this one, and this one needs version two of this one. You can only have one installed in your system, right? So NPM and, and Rust's uh, package manager have basically switched to local dependency model, where you can just install everything in a folder, and then it's OK if you have conflicting versions. And that's meant that people are free to sort of produce smaller units of work, like sort of smaller units of functionality. And so packages have gotten a lot smaller. And so dependency trees have gotten a lot bigger. And so there's lots more people involved in the ecosystem now. There's just like lots more code coming from lots more places. That's one really big difference. Also, you have GitHub, which has changed the way that um, people collaborate. So it's a lot easier to, um, uh, it, it, things move faster. It's a lot easier to get, you know, code is just flying around all the time. In the old days, every different open source project had its own process, its own mailing list you had to sign up for, its own uh, co you know, version control. People didn't all use Git back then. Now everyone's standardized on GitHub, so you have all these more people coming on, and the scale is just completely different than it was um, in, in the old days of open source. Um, yeah, there's other, there's other reasons too, but those are the, the big ones that come to mind. Yeah. OK, so I just wanted to recommend a few classes that you might take if you like this class and if you want to do more security. So uh, next quarter, there's a class called CS255. It's Intro to Cryptography. It's a really great class. I think it's taught by Dan Bonet next quarter. Um, it's, if you liked the TLS part of the, the lecture, you liked you know, the signing and encrypting and this kind of stuff, great class to take. Um, uh, there's also uh, CS155, which is more similar to this class. It's more about sort of implementation and um, less theoretical. Um, and uh, it's a great class. I really highly recommend that one. Um, and then uh, 355 is the continuation of 255. So if you like 255 in winter, you should take 355 in spring. This is a, a graduate uh, level class where you read papers and you do, you do, you know, sorry, you don't read papers. You, you, um, you, uh, you go really deep into crypto, uh, and you, um, you, it's a PSET class just like 255 is. Um, really good class. I, I, I really recommend that one. And then um, these ones, are I, you can't take them until next year. Um, so 251 is, is um, cryptocurrencies and blockchain, which is really fun and has a whole bunch of security um, aspects to it uh, because, of course, the blockchain is this trustless you know, thing, and there's all kinds of, of, of security implications and everything in, in blockchains. Um, and then... Um, this one's in the winter, but the deadline to apply for it has already passed. So CS190 is not strictly a security class, um, but I highly recommend it. Only 18 people get into it. You have to apply, and the deadline's already passed for this year, but you can apply for, for next year. It's taught by John Osterhout, and uh, this is like a really cool class. It's like, um, um, so first of all, it's, it's, like a, it's almost like a writing class. You, 
you literally, there's like, they, they put code up on the, on the whiteboard that the students have written and everyone in the class, it's like a discussion section and you sort of talk about the code and you talk about how it could, be, could have been designed better. It's like a writing class, but for code. You literally learn how to like write beautiful code, code that like uh, is understandable and works well. And you talk about all kinds of design and architecture issues. So it's really great. Um, but the prereq for it is CS140. Uh, so <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a writing class that you have to take operating systems first to do, basically. Um, but yeah, it's really good. It's 18 people. I re recommend applying for it if you're interested. Um, yeah, so these are, these are some classes maybe think about taking. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to end with, I want to say thank you so much for a great quarter. It's been an honor to get to know all of you. And thanks for being uh, adventurous and taking this class uh, with me. And um, yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. Thank, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks.